Um, are we are we just going to listen to Mary first with uh, feedback from overseas? From, and then from, yeah, good, good. Mary will give us feedback from Germany. She has a lot of euros, so she should tell us about the euros we got down to Africa. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm happy you be point. Uh, I'm happy I got euros. I want to share euros. Come to Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. good. <laughs> yes. Now, no. Uh, where do I start? How many minutes do I have, Joshua? All right, run an prize. Half an hour. Half an hour. Um, like 25 minutes, and then we're going to have a five minute. Uh, interval you know for questioning and answers ah nice so myself how many minutes do i have to share my whatever 25. i have 25 minutes 25 okay but are I you long <laughs> no <laughs> i'm just concerned what you're gonna share <laughs> anyway, gonna, um, are, mm -hmm. are you did you want to go first or we put eva first no, I just want to do a bit of introduction and then now we can have maybe lead questions. Joshua can lead us with the lead questions so that one can know what to say on what. Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, all right. Uh, Mary, uh, Marina mm -hmm. Price is moderating us. So I will have um, wish that uh, Marina Price will take up with the lead questions. But the focus is just about pricing. You know, we have issues with people from the West coming to Africa to buy our products. And because they have the thinking of the standard being low and all that, we have very low pricing and sometimes poor pricing. So, Mariana yeah. Price, we have discussed it. Mariana will take through, to you through some lead questions and then you can elaborate on it. But please, just give us about two minutes about what happened in, with, with GIZ in Germany. Amen. No. <laughs> Ma Mariana, oh. please take over, please, Mariana. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Yes, welcome, everybody. And Mary is going to give us some feedback uh, on a Germany trip. And uh, then after that, we will introduce um, Eva Leidenen and then we will go ahead. Thank you, nice. Mary. Okay, thank you so much um, for this opportunity. I really appreciate. Nowadays, opportunities are gold. You rarely get these opportunities and you happen to get them. Just thank God. Um, where do I start? Um, it was just by coincidence. It was early March. Yes, early February. That I happened to be in another program we were doing ISO certification. And it was sponsored by GIZ. And um, along the way, when we were having our tea break, uh, 4 o'clock, not 4, 10 a.m. tea break, I happened to sample my essential oils to the participants. I didn't know anyone in the group. And um, I, I do mix moringa with eucalyptus, with rosemary, and then just to spice it and to try make people have it nice. So I started sampling it in the tea for everybody. I didn't know I was sampling to a donor. And that is how it surprised me. So in the process, um, we went back for the training. And we, when we came back for the lunch hour, um, the guy, now the, the person for GIZ, uh, told me to give me a number and insisted you should call this number and tell them what. Just tell them I gave you my number, the number to call. I didn't call because it was just strange. You don't anyone giving me a number call. You don't know what to say. I didn't call. So the following day I came and he asked me, did you call? I said, no, can you please that call number they are waiting? And I was wondering, I, when the evening when I went home, I'm like, why should I call a number that I don't know? Fine, um, I did call. Now that, that day I went, then the guy asked me, did you call the number? And I'm like, okay, fine, let me call it now. I called the number and the lady picked the call and she asked me, who are you? I was given your number. I know this guy did not come. He just left. After asking me the question, he just left. I'm like, uh, how? Uh, who gave you the number? I don't know. I didn't even remember his name because the thing was not in me. And then uh, she asked me, I remember this was Moses. And I'm like, okay. He's, she's like, okay, who is Moses? I have two Moses. One is colleague, another one is my husband. I do not know. It's a guy who had some earphones and all that, that's the description. 
Okay, he said, fine. Oh, uh, fine. And then I forgot, but I saved the lady's number. Along the way, after two weeks, the training was meant for four days, and we finished, we went back. We do it every month from um, January to August. We're going to finish in August. It is ISO certifications. And uh, the lady called me after. She started was tapping me, and I'm like, who is this? So I had saved her as a natural product because I don't even know her name. And uh, she started commenting anything that I post, anything, and she's like, we are having a physical meeting. Can you please come with your products? And I'm like, where are we meeting? What physical meeting? So I kept asking questions because remember, I do not know this lady. So after three weeks, we happened to do that physical meeting. When I went, that's when she introduced me to the whole thing. And she told me, you know what? This is what we do. We do mentorship. You're working with GIZ on essential oils and you happen to be there. And the other program I was, it was also by GIZ. And this is another one I am in that now is sponsored by GIZ. Then I said, fine. I went there, kept calm, and we finished the whatever you are doing. Um, then went back. After, then we were put in a WhatsApp group. It was a Zoom meeting. We did. After finishing, the lady calls me. And ask me, are you an export girl? I'm like, what export? I don't do export, but I sell to people who does export. Because you know, export comes with its own challenge. And she told me, there is an email coming. Please respond to it. Immediately after the call, it was as early as 8 a.m. After, this is March now. After the call, uh, I got an email saying, we have nominated your companies. We are taking people to Germany to do blah, blah. You go see my teams. Please nominate one person from your company and all that. I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. I said, I feel the form and the process began. And by April we left, we went to Anuga. It is a trade fair for machines. Uh, when we went there, there was a delegation from Kenya. Our company now representing Moringa, we were there. And uh, we didn't do any sales, but we went to see machines. Up there, Okay, in Europe, now we are in Europe. And uh, we went there to window shop for machines. And uh, we were able to do questions because it is a well-organized tour. We were able to meet the government, we were able to meet the stakeholders who are doing ABCD in the food value chain, supply chain. And uh, a lot is there, a lot is happening in Europe. They do not trust our product, that is true. And they do not, the reason why they don't do that, they do not trust the process. Our processing is what they do not trust. And they say that is why they, we have to use their machines, which are certified, ISO certified. So when we send products for testing, because I asked them, why do you have to ask for product like three, four times for testing? They said it is because of the machine we use, the hygiene and all that. So they have to go test the machine. And then in Europe, they are having a lot of food control the contaminants, they're so much concerned with the contaminants, the hazard themselves and the hygiene part of it. Uh, from the whole tour, it was about, um, we were there for eight days, 10 days of course for traveling, two days for traveling, so it was a 10 days tour. But we're, in our stay, we were able to meet people and now have deeper conversation, depending on what we could identify myself, identified the organic people, they are in Africa, they showed me they're in Malawi, uh, others in Mozambique, they're trying to implement a tool, and also in Uganda. So um, then it was all about organic and the, the whole supply chain. And um, also another challenge is the, for you to be able to supply, I'm to say your product is placed in Europe, you have to define your traceability, you have to define your acreage, like you don't say you are farming one acre and you have enough to supply. They don't trust that. And then I was like, why are in, in, in Africa, even farming half an acre is an issue. They said we can only work in a cluster and that is where the whole challenge comes in. And also now that we are housing, the processing and all that. So that is it. Thank you, back to you. Now questions to come. 
Awesome. Thank you very much, Mary. And you yes, see why it's important. That is why it's important to always be prepared, you know, know what you're doing, know what's expected, and also networking, because that was basically part of networking. You were yeah. there at the right time, the right place, and things mm -hmm. actually, you know, can fall into place. But yeah. now we have these challenges with pricing because mm. uh, we are not getting the prices that we're supposed to get. And mm. on top of it, some people are selling at very, very low prices. And that is also another challenge because yeah. it is ruining the whole process. Uh, mm. But what we're going to do is we're going to have now, uh, I'm going to introduce to you Eva Leidenen from Ghana. Mm. She's from Malwa Farm and she's a nutritionist and she's going to tell us her experience and what uh, she thinks that we should be doing and we can ask her afterwards some questions as well. Eva, can I put you, welcome and can I put you to the floor? Yep. Um. Uh oh. Uh oh. Okay. What's wrong? Um, I, 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 I should say I'm not working for Malva Farms anymore. Um, Malva okay. Farms was an um, IPMC computer company, uh, but they ran into a crisis and um, they closed down the project after they sent me to the US for four months to 2019. So yeah. then all the coronavirus blah blah came, but Ghana doesn't really have a, have, we have not had a problem with that, really, uh, because the government have handled the coronavirus situation super duper efficient and treated positive cases with nutrition. And it yeah. was not with Moringa, but everyone was given a herbal based a synthetic, but originally a herbal-based malaria medicine, vitamin C, zinc, and healthy food, and all that. So Ghana government have handled coronavirus very well. So what happened while we had all this going on, I bought my own land. So for the past uh, one and a half year, uh, we have been building up the farm up here in the bush. So I live off grid out in the bush um, in Ghana now uh, with my uh, three horse grooms and my husband is to to come to join us uh, when he retires from Ghana Armed Forces. So um, that's the situation. I'm not producing anything. My aim here is to uh, start Moringa Oil, uh, Moringa for Oil. I believe there is a market, there is a, <coughs> a window of, of opportunity in Europe because of all the mess the mess in the Middle East and the downward spiral of the olive oil production. Moringa oil have very much the same nutritional qualities of olive oil. But I, I know that I'm a, a few years ahead of myself. Um, so I have this land. I, am, uh, I started to work with the, the Indian strain Nomax tree as it has um, much higher yield potential, <laughs> but we ran into hundreds of difficulties. But I have about 100 trees growing, and right now I'm waiting for pollination. I have to get some bees because the lovely neighbor farmers, they put pesticides everywhere. So there right. is actually no pollinating insects here. And I thought I went out to the bush with no farmers around, but they, and they even spray under the canopy of high uh, rainfall. It's very interesting to, to see it and it's a mega problem, but I'm, I'm dealing with it step by step. So I am not producing anything, but I have grown Moringa on three different locations in Ghana and encountered all the different problems around. But this about pricing, uh, I don't know <laughs> much about it, but what I was thinking, when Joshua asked me to join in today is that there are many, many aspects of it. And um, uh, I'm going to go for local markets when we start because it's a long, long process to get export certification, approvals and all that. So uh, what I'm thinking is that the pricing issue is two different pathways and for all pricing globally 
um, there are the aspect of the demographics in a population. And of course, the prices locally in Africa are lower because the buying power of the people of Africa is lower. And why is that? That is, of course, because Africa have uh, a problem with the former colonial powers, mega problem, and the government should deal with that. Uh, but there is also the aspect of the demographics, meaning the, the way the population is put together, because uh, Africa has a very young population, and that means that there is still 40% um, below 18, I think, here in Ghana, and in other countries it's even worse, quote, <laughs> and in some countries it's like South Africa, it's better. But the, the net effect, the net effect of this is that the, the working population who is supposed to take care of the children and the elderly is a very small part. So all their money goes to the basic necessities. And, and it's a luxury to buy like food supplements, herbs. I mean, they do it, but the price will never exceed what they can pay because then there is no local market. So the demographic plays a big role in what you can ask, what price you can ask in the local market, because otherwise you just don't sell it and someone will underbuy you. Um, the other one is that um, um, there is a lot of money wasted. Uh, and I don't think that I should go into this, but that has to do with religion. And uh, I did a calculation here in Ghana and uh, just uh, because of the religious tight system, which I am allergic to, uh, I calculated that just even if we have such a small proportion of the population that is in working age, we have so, so many school kids. Uh, Ghana is actually having around one to two billion US dollars per year one to two billion US dollars per year going into the church's pockets. That is money that is already inside Ghana. And that amount of money could fix the 1,000 schools Ghana is missing in the north. And it's the same in a whole lot of other countries. Like I have a farm in Uganda, I have one in Kenya, about the same. So there is a waste of money that could be used better. And, and I'm not going to to go more into this because all the religious people is going crazy so that's okay then we have the global market and the fact is that the perception of africa is that africa needs help and that is bogus because africa netto actually bleeds 40 to 50 billion us dollars to the rest of the world every single year so if those money stayed in Africa at large, it could fix all the healthcare problems or all the school problems. It could make more or less um, uh, education accessible for all and all that. It could, it could build infrastructure. It could um, industrialize more if that's what we want. Um, so Africa is bleeding a lot of money every single year to the rest of the world. And why is that? That is because uh, there is a lot of tax evasion and there is a lot of mistrust in the governments. And there is a lack of, um, I would say, a quote, cultural resistance to take responsibility for your actions and how you use your money politically. So there is a blaming culture going to the politicians. And I don't say politicians are angels, but they are about the same all over the world. So I don't think the African ones are much worse than the rest in the US or Europe, uh, because I have lived all these places. Um, so there is tax evasion, there is corruptions, and then there is politics. And some of these things are not that easy to solve on a, um, business, a smaller or medium business level. I, I think one of the governments that actually have solved part of it 
Um, it was in the mining industry, and I think it's Namibia. Don't hold me on to it. But it's, I think Namibia put as a prerequisite for mining companies to mine their copper that the percentage the Namibian government get from the mining companies follow the, the world price. And that's not the case in countries like Ghana and at least Sierra Leone I know something about. Uh, they, they go into some very, very bad agreements with these big uh, multinational companies. And that's, that trickles down into a lot of other uh, situations. So the governments definitely have to step up for Africa. Yes, they have to. And the, the, the voters have to tell their politicians that we are done with corruption. And that's corruption on the small level and on the big level. And we are willing to pay tax. In Europe, we pay 40 to 50% tax. And here in Ghana, people pay 5, 5%, 10% if, if they pay at all. So um, the governments don't have much money to work with. And then the corruption steps in. So I think this price thing is a complicated matter. It's really, really complicated. But the one thing that producers must do is to convince about the quality and about um, about a responsibility for the money going the right place. I mean, we need to have absolutely 300% transparency. So we have to document that, for instance, a certain percentage of the money goes to, of course, some will go to, to development, some will go for tax, some will go for some kind of um, social responsibility development. Um, I'm building a school in the north where there is no school. Uh, we are building a safe house for gender-based violence, um, women and children in Kenya. I mean, we to document all this that you are actually doing the thing so you can document that there is no corruption involved in the whole chain of events and i think that's kind of the most important for the rest of the world to start to trust africa because africans dupe themselves also a lot so uh, it's not it's not on the it's it's on the big level on the political level yes but it's also on the small level in the day-to-day -day life and and we have to, we have to grasp that. And we have to, we have to put a work discipline in when we're working. Uh, here where I am, people don't work that much. Then they complain they don't have any money. Yes, but they also don't work. So even, I mean, I have farm workers here and it takes, I, I have a good group now, but it, it takes some trial and error to get good people who are actually putting in the work they are expected to. I pay them very well. They have everything they need, electricity, good beds, medical care. They have everything they need. And I expect them to work efficiently six hours per day, which I think is fair enough in a tropical humid climate. It yeah. is demanding. Yes. So there are many, many, many things we need to deal with. And I think a lot of it is macroeconomics. Okay. Eva? Yeah? Eva? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We hear you. We're running out finish, of time. Finish. Yes, finish for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I shut my mouth. Can, uh, I'm giving five minutes for questioning uh, for Eva on um, what you want to ask. Who wants? to ask a question yeah yeah i have a question for eva yeah good thank you eva Jessica. so uh, uh, yes regardless of uh, regardless of all the challenges we're facing yes still so there should be a threshold there should be a minimum amount that we should know that even though we have all these challenges around which some of them are government issues and all that we should still have at least a baseline for an amount, for example, like maybe Moringa seeds. Moringa seeds wouldn't go through a lot of processing. So at least there should be a minimum amount that we should be looking at. And this is why we're trying to pay yes. ourselves because sometimes even the bigger companies, they have all the certification, but yet still, when you go down, down deep into their works, you see that there are still some short holes and shortcomings. So there should be a minimum amount that we should be looking at. What is your suggestion, Eva? Well, I think, um, I mean, of course, you need to have the basic costs covered, and then you need to double at least that. Of, yes. 
when you when when companies like import companies in Europe they import something from somewhere, uh, then they have a cost for a, a, a cost a brutal cost for that, and then they they multiply it by two point three to two point seven for the final price. So, and I think African companies have to do the same because we need to generate an amount of uh, pro we call it profit or an amount of extra that goes into development of the business. And I have no idea about the cost for doing seeds or leaves or anything. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, yeah, but it, all right. it does cost extra to have a transparent, transparent, documented uh, lines all the way through a production. It does cost extra, yes. Yes, we agree, uh, Eva. It is, uh, that, that's also something that's very important. Uh, people have to go back to the drawing board and make sure the business plans are totally in place. But um, that is still not the main reason for pricings that are, you know, totally out of place. Anybody else got a question for Eva? Anyone else? Yes. Hello, Harold. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, please. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, you're welcome, Tim Eskin. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. For Eva, what, I am from Ethiopia. Um, yes, Eva raised some certification quality issues concerning Moringa production and the long chain. The, the long chain of uh, market from uh, her country context. Uh, what she think the solution for uh, this, the long chain or the bureaucratic way of how uh, the quality is managed? I think the, the documentation is, the, the, the documentation meaning the registration is everything. Okay. And that is a very difficult thing for at least a lot of the Africans I have dealt with. <laughs> so, and it's not to step on anyone's toes, but it's just not in the culture here in West Africa, at least. So um, the registration of what you're doing, I mean, the registration on where is the plantation? You can take pictures, you can write some things in a book. It, it need not be very fancy. But you, you have to register what you are doing and you have to document, I mean, for organic, I'm aiming for organic certification and it's likely going to take me one more year before I'm there, but I have to secure that I have no pollution around and meaning I cannot use all my land for growing what I want because I need boundaries to, to, to keep my, my products, my plants, my trees away from these farmers who are running wild with their spraying machines. So there, the documentation and the registration is not really part of the culture. And, and that has to happen. I mean, I know, I know one company here in Ghana who actually do Moringa for tea and she do Moringa and other things as well. And I, I, I don't know where she got all the money from, but she has put at least 1 million Ghana cities into the process. It's very, very costly. On the other hand, we have uh, Paul Yepua, who's passed now, but the, um, the Ghana Permaculture Institute in Tejiman, and he did an outgrower screen with 8,000 8, 8, small scale growers. And that's where my heart lies. And he, managed, he managed to do it on a bush level. Hello? Do, do hey. the registration on a bush level. They managed to do it. It hello? can be done. Yes, hello? it can be done. Who is saying hello? I think we had somebody who is just saying something. Hello? Mary, can we put you to the uh, to the floor? We will carry on with some more questions to Eva later because we need to get going with the rest of the, the two presenters. Mary, you are to the floor. I see your hand up as well. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I agree with Eva. Mary, will you introduce yourself to what you are and where you're from and uh, your company's name as well, please? 
thank you. I will do that. Uh, I'm Mary once again, um, coming from Kenya. I run a company called Agri Nutrition Enterprise. And our work is uh, Moringa throughout. We are in Moringa 24-7. And um, we, started, we started doing this so, in 2012. Mary, can I just interrupt? Can uh, Harold and Stanley and Timis can uh, yeah. please uh, uh, Good. Yes. Uh, can you just happy to meet you. Yes. While she's presenting, please. Thank you. Uh, okay. Have you given me the chance? Who is speaking? Can I speak? Okay. Who is speaking? Who is speaking? Who is this? Yeah. Have you given the chance to me? Who is speaking? Who is that? Sorry, I, I'm on my cell phone. I can't see who's trying to speak. Okay, let um, let I will I will speak from Ethiopia. Uh, Temeskan uh, is speaking. Temeskan, yes. we will give yes. you a chance to speak just now. We, we will give you time to ask questions. We need to uh, proceed with the presentation with okay. uh, Mary. Nice. Thank you. Good. I will give you time after she's done a presentation. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. Temeskan. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Mary. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, like I was saying, I'm Mary. I'm from Kenya and I run a company called Agri Nutrition. We are in Moringa Valley Chain 24 7. We started this in 2012. We started addressing, when I came across Moringa in a conference, we started addressing the issue of Moringa from propagation, crop management, post harvesting, and valley addition. All this time, I've been in Moringa, and um, yes, we have tried and tried and tried many stuff. And for sure, Moringa is miracle tree. And uh, from my observation and what I can say, there is market and Moringa is more needed in Africa than in Europe. The problem we have, as African like ever said, is we always think other people are better than we do in Africa, where yet we are in the highest potential because a lot of the staff are coming from Africa to Europe. And yet we receive a lot of donations uh, from uh, Europe to Africa. And now my challenge is goes to Africa Moringa Hub. Like I remember the years back, we tried to come up with something common it was not achievable. I do not know why, but this is the high time that we have to do it. Not we don't have a choice if we want to progress. Why? Because we produce a lot of moringa, and only ten percent it is in the market. Ninety percent it is not in the market. This one I can and testify. Uh, the case in the Kenya. Oh, this one I can testify in the uh, case in Kenya where have a lot of farmers in my networking group and I fail them because I do not sell all what they are producing. The reason being there is no man, there is no market. I mean that we are not able to take everything to the market and the market is there. The challenge is capacity building. How do we sensitize people to adopt Moringa? How do we sensitize people to do Moringa, to use Moringa within Africa? Because we didn't need it. Everybody is talking about malnutrition in Africa. It is true, it is there. But Moringa has the solution. Whether oil, or whether the powder. When it comes to the oil, the oil is there. But the few who are doing it, the cost is so high that it is not attractive in the market. Now, how do we reduce this? These are the kind of the questions that we should address. Um, when it comes to the issue of exports, uh, export of Moringa requires certification, which require a lot of millions. These millions, if we bring them to ourselves, fine, we can raise this million no matter through the fundraising uh, mechanism that we, we are going to come up with. And then we inject this to our own communities. I do not know how, but we are going to work on it. And also in Europe, when you are thinking of selling Moringa, um, the, taking the case in Germany, I realized people are not cooking. They don't have time for cooking. They want finished food. They want ready to eat food. Because even if you send a whole container of Moringa, who is going to pack it? 
who is going to put it in the market, it may need you, it may need you another two years to send another container. We don't have control. We don't have control pricing, and it is a challenge uh, from the farm gate to the consumer. And um, I'll give an example here in Kenya because uh, we deal with farmers and we are wholesalers. When we sell, uh, taking the same product in the markets, and we have sold to a certain wholesaler, and we go to the market. Uh, you find the same same product, one small product, one uh, sm a few grams of moringa retails at the price that you sold a whole kg to the retailer. Now um, that's become a challenge, and that is why the main reason why moringa does not move in the market because it is regarded as an expensive product, and it is a challenge because nobody is in it, nobody is wants to control it, nobody cares about it. And it is left to be a product you go by on your need, regardless who is in the government. Uh, like in the government, the way Eva was saying, the government is not even interested. I have been trying to talk to the Ministry of Agriculture, the Research Institute for Food here in Kenya, and they will tell you there's no policy on Moringa, there is no structure on Moringa. And now it becomes hard for you to make any move. Yeah, that's my take. And I don't know how we are going to do it as a, the hub for Africa, because we have a lot of work to do. It is our passion, it is our challenge, and we have to uptake it if we want to see success. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I truly appreciate your, your input. Uh, for uh, Mary. Uh, there was a question earlier from the one guy as well. Uh -huh. Yes, you're welcome to ask questions for Mary. All right, Mary, uh, let me let me give you let, let me ask a question. So, from from your experience from the, the workshop you attended, is it mm -hmm. that in the West is there a concern about the machines we use or the general standard that is a problem? The general what? Hunger. I'm saying that from the from the workshop you attended and from uh -huh. the little conversations you had behind the scenes with yes. the West, is there a challenge with Africa products, especially Moringa products? Is it about the machines we use, the machines not being certified, or it's the production process that they have an issue with, or both? Oh, the West has a challenge with everything that we are doing in terms of Moringa, from growing, processing, marketing, everything. They have a challenge so, with everything. So it means we, we are doing nothing? According to them. Yes, but, we but, are but doing I, I don't think, But I don't think that is right. It's, it's not right. Yeah, because the reason why it is like that, remember I said, yet we are doing something because they are interested with the Moringa that we produce. But they come close to us like we are doing nothing, meaning we are not organized. And it is but don't, you, but don't you also see that in, in, in selling, in selling, somebody trying to beat down price can let you look inferior just to get a very good price or take an advantage over you. That's, that's also another strategy we use in sales. You can just tell somebody that this is not right, this is not right, this is not right and give a very bad price for the product. Meanwhile, there are some good elements in it, but it's also another strategy of beating down pricing. Don't you also think so? Yes, yes. Uh, but uh, everything is behind something when it comes to the West getting the product, the Moringa from Africa. This by this I say, they will say, yes, we need, like I was told, we need, how many containers are you able to send us? And I'm like, as many as you want because the Boringa is there. And then they ask you, what certifications do you have? You tell them, I have East African certification for organic. Then they will say, we do not recognize that. What do you recognize? They want other certification body. Fine, you go ahead assuming you have, you have uh, EcoCert, you have certified with them as organic and you have met their standard. Then they will go and ask, um, have you done, done some testing with, um, SGS, SGS, yes. 
how many times, what are the results? Then they go again and ask you, HACCP, all these things are calculating around the money. If you have everything, they will then again ask you, do you, are you ISO certified? Are you ISO 2001 certified? Are you ISO 1400 certified? You see, all that is revolving around the money. And yet they will tell you your product does not qualify, that is Moringa. But yet somebody from Europe will come, do the things on ground and be able to sell, dictating the price that you're going to sell them. And because you're desperate, you're going just to sell it. I, I agree. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this, this argument can go off and on, but I am a salesperson and I know some of the strategies we use in selling. And... Um, Sometimes I have some reservations on some of these issues. The reason is this. There are companies, European companies in Ghana, doing the same as we're doing it. And yes. they have more market than that of the African side. Now, this mm -hmm. is how it happens. If I decide, like in Ghana now, and I decide to go and do production in Germany, and mm -hmm. I tag my products made in Germany, I will, mm -hmm. more, I will make more sales than made in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Of course. We could, have, we could have all the same equipment, everything the same. But when I tag yes. my products make, made in Germany, I will sell faster than made in Ghana or made in Kenya or made in uh, any of these countries. So some of the times, uh, some of the people take advantage over this side and then downplay our products. And then make mm -hmm. it, even though we have our shortfalls, but they can downplay the products and bring you as low as possible and then make the purchase, then go over there and sell it at high rocketing prices. The same product, mm -hmm. the same product. But for, let me give an example. For instance, look at this, our normal Moringa seeds. These are farm products, which after harvesting the seed, there is no any, any certification involved. I have harvested my seeds from the farmers. That same, that same Moringa seed is sent to Europe and the price will shock you. But that same Moringa seed, Selling in Africa, if you hear the price, it will discourage you. Moringa seed doesn't need any certification after, after you've harvested it. I don't know, maybe the, the, this, uh, maybe technical people can say something different, but when I harvest from the tree, I don't know whatever certification I have to do again. But it will give you very low price. But let me put that same yeah. Moringa seed in the pack and then, and then target made in Australia. And here the price I will get out of that. And that is the reason why I'm telling you, Joshua, they don't want you to go and do that in Germany unless you have uh, uh, partnered with them, meaning they have downplayed you. And that is what I'm insisting. It is upon us as Africans come up with a working plan. How are we going to control all this? What standard are we going to set for ourselves so that when a visitor comes, they have Wait. to see... M Mary, but do you know that structures. Mary, do you know that if we have our own standards, mm -hmm. we can only operate in our market, it will not be approved by the West. Do you know that? Not really, not really. Ask me why. Because S SGS, I'm saying SGS is in SGS is a global certification organization. We have some in Ghana. SGS is, is global. But if I go and yeah. do my certification in a different lab, that is maybe a Ghana lab, mm -hmm. the West will tell you that they don't still trust it. So go and do it with SGS or go and do it with uh, any of these education organizations that has got its headquarters in Europe or in the West. That is why I'm answering you the question by telling you this. We are not organized and we are known not to be organized. The same way, I'll give you an example. If I come to Ghana today and start saying things in your house, you're not going to let it because you're in charge. But if you're not in charge, I bring my Kenyan way and I'll start operating in your house. That is the case we are in Africa. I agree. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's very true. That's very true. Yeah. Because we have certification organizations in our uh, Kenya, you have uh, Food and Drugs Authority. Ghana, we have Food and Drugs Authority. South Africa has got here. Almost all the African countries has got Food and Drugs Authority. But yet still, when we get it to them and we get it out and we have a certificate from the Food and Drugs Authority, the West will still tell you that, no, we don't trust this source. Do it at this company. Do it at this company. We, those companies, too, are being headed by the West. Yes. So, anyway. um, there's a lot of noise coming in. I don't know why. Yeah. You have to join a third session. Is that so? 
Mariana Price. Ma Mariana. Oh, okay. That is the third section. This one will have to end before the third section. So don't worry. That's the third section. But I think I have a comment. I have a comment. Okay. Okay. And a lot of, I don't know which noise this is. It's very, um, someone, someone is having a very noisy background. Is it possible to mute it? Helen, can you put your, uh, Noise off your Let's see who it is. Okay, that was good. A lot of this comes down to documentation, registering every single little stupid step, even when you think it's not necessary, just register. And the other thing is that what I see here in Africa is this suspicion and the lack of trust in fellow Africans. And the lack of trust means not working together. So everyone is trying to fend for themselves. Uh, so when you, Mary, say something about this machines and this registration and this and that, I have been into wanting to do the Moringa for oil for years here in Ghana. And the trying to get people to work together and use one of the very high quality oil presses that don't dash off little metals into whatever it's doing has not been possible. I, I don't know how many oil presses we have in Ghana, but I have not even been able to find that information. And I live here and I know all the people, but when I ask them these very, very specific questions, I don't get an answer from the Africans. So there is really a cultural problem on not working together. The way normal farmers in Europe became um, not rich, but got a decent life. I believe it's, it's about getting a decent life for all the small farmers out there. Uh, it's not about prosperity and getting shit rich. It's about getting a decent life. And the way that the European farmers did it was to do community work. They work together. Yes, there are problems in that and it takes a lot of time, but it's the only way forward. So I still don't know how many oil presses and of which quality do we have in Ghana. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to buy one from Europe myself because I can do it and then I'm going to put the work together. But I don't get the reply from Joshua or from Divine no, no. Morney or from John Chocley or wait. all the other Moringa guys. I don't get wait. the answer. Wait, wait, uh, Eva, let, let me I explain. Have please, before. I have tried. No, you don't need to explain. But this <laughs> has a lot to do with trust. This has to do with the trustworthiness. And as long as the Africans don't have the trust within themselves, it's a, it's a projection. It is a psychological projection that the Europeans are all these bad people. And of course we are. Yes, we are. Because the rules in Europe are damned strict on quality. And if I start to export anything to Europe, I cannot live. One out of 200 outgrowers can spoil the whole business of putting pesticides on the trees or whatever. One out of 200 yes, can spoil so the whole thing. Huh? Eva? And, yeah? Thank you. I think it's we, the we, same in Kenya. Yes, uh, that is, I, I understand what you're saying and I understand your point. And we have to come to the solutions of teaching people how to yes, work together. Yes, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. serious effort. We've been trying for many years to bring yes, people to the yes. table. <laughs> But yeah. we will evolve. And we have to give now Stanley, who was also one of our um, guests that we invited. Is Stanley here, Joshua? Is Stanley uh, already on the, on the group? Yeah, Stanley, wow. We lost him for the second section because he was on the first. But I don't know whether he didn't get the, the new 
Wow. Let me um, send it to him, please. Yeah, so let me send it to him. Online. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Let, let me get to him. Anybody want to ask a question to um, Mary? Any of to Mary, please. Yes, but but uh, Marina Price, please, uh, just a minute. Let me clarify with uh, either side. With the machines, this is what I know. Those who have the machines, I don't do production. I am selling for people. I don't do production, so I don't have any machine. But let me clarify this. Those having machines in Ghana, uh, the little I know is that some of them are afraid of competition. And they always want to stay on top. So if he goes to get his machine from Germany, he tries to hide it from the public just because he or she wants to stay on top. And that is the experience I have had. Even with me, there are people who I call to come and do presentations and they decline. If you want to ask them any questions, they will tell you. But when you want them to come on in the public and then explain how, why they are succeeding and all that, they decline, many people. So it's a habit that we, we, are, we are facing. There are big, big companies, big guys who are doing big jobs in, in Europe and in the US. And I have several times discussed with them, but they don't want to come on board. Their reason is that they wouldn't come and explain what they are doing and they face competition. So either with the machines, I even in person with the Moringa oil machines, I have had countless challenges getting such information from them. Some of the, some of the images I share are from people outside Ghana and other African countries. But inside Ghana, it's very difficult to be able to let somebody get you into his production site. It's very, very difficult. It doesn't normally happen. They will never let you see the equipment they are using. And that is, it's, it's about them. And I mean, they decide not to let you know. And that is it. So uh, it's not in general, but some of the people, especially the big players, they do that. They will not let you know what they are using, how they are using it. So that is about that explanation, um, uh, Mariana Price. But then all the small ones have to come together to become strong. That is fine. That is fine. Because why I come to you most of the times is that you are very open and you are ready to teach. There are people who didn't do that. Even ask them that, what oil machine are you using? They tell you, oh, Joshua, I'll get back to you soon. Don't worry. I'll call you. I'll meet. They will tell you funny stories. They, they will not let you it. know. They, don't they will not it. let you know. Even if you tell them you are coming to pay them a visit at their work site, they will decline. Many people. So those that you see that we share on Facebook and around are from the small, smaller glories. And they are ready to learn and they are ready to share. But the big players, they wouldn't do it. They would not do it. And forget the big. That is it. That is why we are trying. That is it. That is why we are always with the small farmers around. And they also need the big players to learn from them. There is a company in Ghana selling very big in the US, very big. Countless times you will not get him to, to, to give you any information, never. But one person cannot take over the whole market. It's impossible. So we have Joshua, to move on. So and focus. Is it not maybe time that all the small guys who want to be together actually come together as a huge African team and start working together and then take on those other markets that are available. Because if they come together and they are doing the right thing, learning from, um, I mean, there's many places to learn. It is not like one or two people are the only people that can trade and that can do it right. Groups can also do it right. Yeah, yes. yes. But with the, yes. Challenge, yes. With, the, with the challenge with the groups, this is my experience. You will notice that the farmers are doing their best, but majority of our farmers want to sell in Europe or in the West. And there are and in the West we have standards. So they are not able to cross that line. Then in the local market also, they are not able to do enough publicity to be able to sell. So they get stuck. Then the big players too, they have all the certification. They can go into Europe. They can go into the West and sell very well. But they also do not want to also buy from the local farmers or the smallhold farmers. So they have their own outgrowers. So if you are not within that circle, you don't get business or you don't get part of the cake. So it's either you come and then, and, and then be in that circle, then they can buy from you. And when they are buying from you, they buy from you at a very low rate. Yes. Very low rate. Then if you also decide not to join that circle and you want to sell a loan, you don't have the buyers. And the buyers you have, you cannot meet their demand in terms of 
uh, standards. And in the local market too, you haven't done enough to get local buyers. So you go along and you get stamped. Alternative to there are other farmers too who get orders that will come to them. I need 10 tons. But that farmer knows he or she cannot supply the 10 tons. Instead of that local farmer to say, oh, Eva can supply 10 tons. So let me liaise with Eva. And then we both do the supply. That person too will kill the business. Then it dies there. So these are petty, petty, petty issues that are killing the business. And we keep saying there are no buyers. They are buyers. But the challenge is that if it goes to the big players, they would like to buy from the small farmers at a very discounted rate. If you don't join them and you want to sell it direct to the end buyer, you cannot meet his or her standards. Nobody would like to ship from Ghana or, or Africa 10 kilos or 5 kilos. They want it in tons. How many local farmers can meet that requirement in tonnage? They cannot. This is where we are always fighting day in and day out. Yeah, so just want to, to comment on that. It's the same, right? Uh, pretty much you connected on the, the gaps you indicated. Uh, so basically you indicated uh, there are local farmers, you know, small farmers, uh, but then they are not able to, um, you know, come up with the certifications, et cetera, to the level, the quality, you know, it's expected outside the market. Uh, but but like uh, Eva and Mariana suggested, if you can uh, uh, form like a cooperate, you know, with a group of farmers together, uh, maybe not all farmers, they have expertise or knowledge about the, the certificate, you know, the market outside. But people like you or anyone, you know, who understands the market outside, mm -hmm. they can be that linking pin or a connection uh, towards securing, you know, the certificates, the quality standards. So then they can play that role of connecting, you know, this group of farmers towards the outside market. Because yeah, the reason I'm sharing, I, I have a same challenge, maybe uh, yeah, India is as you know, more or less similar in, in some aspects from Africa perspective. So in, in my thinking as well, I had a good conversation with Mariana also three, four days. I do see the same challenge, especially when you talk about the, the prices. Uh, yeah, it's a very good topic in that sense. So I want to join this meeting. Uh, most of the time, the problem is the traders in between, they are on the negotiation table. So, for example, they get from, like you said, the, the small farmers with a very low price, and then they get it, and then I see on the real negotiation table, maybe four or five uh, traders, uh, even say five or six, they try to get, a, I need 10 percentage, 10 percentage, 10 percentage out of, you know, the real margin that comes from customer to the real produce price. So that's where we need to basically, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with the traders. Yes, it's good. If you are one trader connecting the, the, the farmers with the correct customer, that's good. But not like, you know, 10 traders getting all the money and then pushing the farmers to the in a corner. Good, that is the point, that is the point. Now, let me give you a critical example in Ghana. Mm -hmm. I know a big player, let me use in dollars. He's buying Moringa seeds from the farmers as low as like $3. Uh -huh. When he buys from the local farmer, direct from the farmer, farm gate at $3, then he sells it at his warehouse at $8. Uh -huh. Now, if you don't sell to him, you cannot get a buyer. So if he buys from you today, this morning at $3, then in the evening, if you, that same farmer, come to his warehouse to buy from him, he's going to sell to you at $8. Yeah. Just the same, the same city, the same location, the same everything. When he's going to Europe or he's going to the West, the price is different. The challenge here is that if the farmer doesn't give it to that big player, he or she wouldn't get a buyer. That same farmer hasn't got access to the internet to go and sell on the internet. So it's like... Moringa, there is nothing in Moringa. But trust me, let me be very honest with everyone. There is good money in Moringa. Moringa pays very well. If you, have, if you play your cards well, it's, you, you will make it. But the biggest challenge they have is if you're not exposed to the West or you don't have access to the internet and those stuffs, you will farm it and you'll be dealing with $3, $4. People are in Ghana selling Moringa seeds for $10. Locally. So if you sell Moringa seeds, PKM2, for $10, and you're able to sell about 10 kilos in a, in, a, in, a, in a month, it's not a bad deal. But how many people can get access to that? And that's what Eva was saying. Such a person, too, when you go and tell him that 
please let me know the equipment you are using for maybe your powder. You are using a hammer mill. Let me look at it. Let me look at it. How much? He's not going to let you know. So when the Europeans come to buy, they are looking at what machines are you using. So because you are using maybe a local grinding mill, they wouldn't buy from you. Yeah, but, but I can understand. Yeah, so I fully understand, Joshua, what you mean. But you don't need to rely on you know those business perspective only profit oriented big uh, yeah elephant whatever name we say we don't need to rely on uh, them for all the knowledge right the knowledge is out there even in the public uh, you know institutes like if you go to universities uh, there are places where you can still get this knowledge i think what is really lacking is uh, connecting all these dots. That, that's basically what I'm, I mean, as you know, I have been recently exploring all this, how I can, you know, contribute to, uh, I mean, my region, even on a global level, mainly supporting all the small farmers. What I see is the, is the missing link connecting uh, the farmers who has less knowledge on the market scenarios, like you said, or how to secure the, the high quality in terms of processing, even, even the producing wise, you know, farming wise, etc. Uh, I think that to, to me, if we have the right people with the right, you know, uh, vision and uh, the mindset, you know, to help people rather than only stealing money, always only doing the trading. Uh, yes, I mean, it's not for charity. If you need to only do it for free, you cannot do it for a sustainable longer term. As you said, there is money in Moringa business. So we need to, for example, have someone, yeah, even for example, I want to fill that gap in India now. That's what I was telling to Maria and I'm still exploring all the need. That's the reason I'm trying to join, you know, building my network, understanding the market. So what I would like to do, for example, I'm already trying to connect with some academic advisors from universities. Also, there are some agriculture experts. I mean, not everyone is behind money, right? There are some good souls uh, they have knowledge when I tell them this vision of you know helping more people, helping more farmers to be sustainable. Even, I mean, there are many cases, like I told last time, some of my friends and family, they even have to displace from their native place to other countries, Gulf countries, just to earn, you know, 200 euros per month, leaving their families. But yeah, like you said, in Moringa or other plants, you have business. It's the only thing they are not able to get the price that they want when they do agriculture by themselves, that's why they leave all the lands, they run away. But if we can bring back, you know, them and then give them the right connections from universities or, or anywhere, you know, with the right people like us who can communicate, you know, with the right experts and then set that standard, maybe have one processing unit. Uh, yes, we will also get some money because to connect the advice we need to pay them as a consulting fee, et cetera, let it be. But out of, let's say, if you take the margin of, you know, when you sell 100 euros, just an example, uh, out of 100 euros, you can give it to farmer, maybe 25 euros. Now they only get 5 euros. Give them 20 euros additional and then take the remaining 75 for all the other work you do. Yes, it, it is not easy. It is tough. But yeah, I think we need to bring the ch ch change. Otherwise, we are stuck in the second gear. Every time only we are, in my opinion, blaming all the, the big uh, shops. And then the, all the farmers are always beaten and then we are not doing proper farming. Uh, that's where the problem also comes, right? They, the farmers also, when they do not get right pricing, they also yeah, start to lie, right? They say, I did not put any pesticide. They, that's another problem in India also, we have the same problem. They also do not clean. They, I mean, if they don't get correct price, uh, pr price as a fair price, uh, they also start to say, okay, then I, I just uh, you know, throw the bad product and then whenever I get money, I just get it and then run away. So it's, it's the whole system has to change in that sense. But can I bring something to the table here? Uh, I know about people as well. They say they have agents working for them and um, help them to get their sales but they like you say there are little lies being told and they come up with uh, wrong information sometimes there's three four um, agents that are dealing with uh, agents, the paperwork are being um, you know, filled with and that is not just regarding moringa that's selling a lot of things on exports and level but we also have to build our local markets i know everybody wants 
wants to export, but yet our local markets need to take um, a preference as well. And we need to educate and teach. And that's where Africa Marina Hub has been playing a very, very important role to actually bring awareness, bring the knowledge across, and we need support from the farmers. Because without that, without the farmers joining nothing. I see we're going up to uh, Zoom. So if we get cut off, please just join in on the next Zoom. Harold, you wanted to say something. Yes. Are you there, Harold? Harold's mic is off. Harold, can you put your microphone on, please? Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear hello? you. Hello? Yes, it's okay. Yeah. Come on, Harold. Can you hear me now? Come go on. Ahead, go I'm ahead, Harold go Tembe. ahead. I'm Harold Tembe. I mean, I've been in Moringa since 2003. Well, for me, the platform was humanitarian because it was during the war time. A lot of people were Moringa, use Moringa to train people for them to use it after their trainings to combat under fives for under five children, uh, war affected people. But going on, they realized that a lot of people, it brought a lot of satisfaction to people and people were willing to pay for it. So some of our participants um, went into the market and trade, set up trade. It was all over the place, you know. And uh, later on, they became business. They became trained because what we did was we gave free trainings to people in the communities and uh, they started doing business with it. But in Sierra Leone, it is not very very popular. It is not really at that level, at that business level. You know, I am the lead in Moringa for nutrition and I've, I adopted it in our local diet for store and uh, it has gone wide and people are using it. So lately, I thought that uh, I could go into it and improve my knowledge in commercial production and that is what I am to. But Coming back to what we have been hearing from the discussions, I think that we have a market for it. But what Africa needs is, first of all, we have to use technology I call. We have to define what we want to do. We have to, we have to prioritize the problems. Which, what are the problems that are really affecting Moringa for this market? We have to find, those are like a statistical diagram, a beam which we can, what we we can analyze our situations and find a way out and control it. Definitely, there's a big opportunity here, particularly in Sierra Leone. We are not into using chemicals in our farms. It is so natural. We have enough. We have, we have done a lot of People really have People have really got the idea of what is Moringa. We have told them what is contained in Moringa. It has all the nutrients that it contains, and you have to regularly use it. But up to this day, since I, we are very new that is community monitor, the others that are just coming in for me, they are just producing products that are, cannot be regularly used by the public. But we can produce tea, we can look at sauce for me. Like the other time, we have also, we can use the powder as sauce instead of tea. So that is a big market. But one thing is something we are very few here. We have all the natural resources. But one thing is support, financial support to undertake the large production. For us, we are very reliable. I mean, we, I know Africa is 
uh, it's rely unreliable. But when it comes to something that is economical, we are we are willing to accept partners to work with them honestly and with transparency to make sure that we earn money because we are just coming from war. So people are very much willing to, to undertake those things. But the problem is that we are limited in resources. So what we what people have been doing was to plant around their their homesteads and uh, generate a little bit of money. But if we can be we can have partners, we can organize the market correctly, we can define what we want to do, we can measure. Yes, that, yes, as, uh, the argument is that we have a ready market here, but we don't we are not very advanced like in Ghana. Because uh, we don't have big farms here, but right now I'm just in the process of setting up the one acre farm and with um, knowledge experience sharing in, in, in India. I have a meeting every week. Every week I hold a meeting, a, a knowledge exchange program to establish a one acre trial. So we have a big opportunity here in Sierra Leone. The Moringa thing is not as saturated really. And there is need for that kind of business. Because in this world, we have initially the colonial people introduced cocoa and coffee, and today it's in high gear. So also Moringa, everybody accepts it. We have a lot of people who want it in and out of the country. So if now that I'm part of this network, I'm really, I mean, sending a message out. If there are, if there are any hands, any supports, I mean, please, we are welcome. I will, will promise you that we'll cooperate with you and we'll give you all the, what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. I really appreciate your input. Um, is there, and I will definitely, um, you know, have a conversation with you regarding uh, Zambia because there are some very big farmers there that needs a lot of help there. Um, and who else uh, needs to ask a question? I just want to say I'm really impressed about what you're telling, Harold. I have been in Sierra Leone also, and it's not that I know so much about the country. The soil seems to be better than what we have here in Ghana. But I'm really impressed about what you have done. Wow, well done. Thank you, Eva. Anyone Thank else you. need to Thank ask? You, Anyone and else? I, and, uh, no, I just want to say the same as Harold said, that I believe you have to provide free training, support, uh, access to inputs. Like, for instance, here, with, I'm just going to give a stupid small example with the maize and the fall, fall armyworm. Uh, we did our own little organic spraying with uh, wood vinegar and neem leaves that we blended and we didn't have a problem on the maize. It's just small, but we didn't use the chemicals and they are doing well. And you have to secure that those local farmers, all the small outgrowers have the access and don't profit from them, don't exploit them. There are so many people who have exploited them over the years and you need to build communities. That is what Eva, Europe did, and that is what yeah. Harold is doing, and that is the way forward. And it may take time, but it's it's honest and it's sustainable and it's trustworthy. I agree, Eva. They are uh, exploiters, and um, you know it's like you don't want to go into war with them, but you have to take them on and actually make sure that they uh, put back into the communities and not just taking off the communities. But then also we need to train more. Uh, yes. But we also need assistance from our governments because I, I'm very, very, I can almost say I'm disgusted to know that the governments are not supporting, um, you know, the farmers like they should. They, they will do it with maize and with all the other growing things. But when it comes to uh, all the natural, um, plants like your neem, your moringa and all that that's very important out there they are not supporting yes they talk about it even on international level they speak about it it's on everybody's tongues but they are not doing anything and yes we are uh, working hard uh, to bring that onto the tables all the time 
And I Anyone? think that that is a pan-African thing because the European Union have, and that is one of the completely unjust situations between Africa and Europe, that in Europe, the farmers get subsidies for every acre they grow. When I was growing grass for my horses in Europe, I got around uh, 2,300, 2,500 Ghana cities. That's about going close to $350 per hectare for growing grass for my horses. Hmm? Yeah, that's something that uh, Africa is not used to support with. And no. uh, it's even the same. So, Africa is much more on her own, and that speaks into that Africa have to work together. And having the leverage on Europe or US or whatever, but um, because farmers in Europe get subsidies from the government through the European Union organization. And that subsidy in Europe could feed a whole family here in Africa. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and African farmers don't know that. I was, uh, anyway, let me just keep quiet. <laughs> yeah, cry. Uh, yeah, I was trying to say something, but let me. <laughs> um, yeah, Africa, we have our own way. So now mm -hmm. with the pricing, uh, it means we still haven't been able to make a headway with the pricing. We cannot even give um, a minimum amount looking at a minimum because it's still not very fair what we are experiencing online with pricing. Some of the countries are selling too low, too low. But then someone should make a document and put the actual numbers into a spreadsheet because I totally have no Sorry, idea. I was gone for a bit. No, yeah. You know, we, um, we, we, we Joshua? Don't... Yeah. You okay. have something more that you would like? Yes, um, Eva was talking about putting something together in a spreadsheet. With, with production, with, evalu with evaluated products, it's going to be difficult. Every producer will have his own way of selling it. But I was looking at something, for example, minimum, like the, the, the seeds, like the, I mean, just the raw powder, just only the powder. There should be a minimum because it, uh, Sometimes it's, it's very disappointing when you hear figures that are being sold out for products. It kills your spirit. And you imagine how much is a farmer just getting and can the farmer sustain his or her business? Because as low as $3, as low as $4, $2.5 a kilo, it's just something that we shouldn't encourage. At least there should be a minimum amount, regardless of um, the challenges that we are facing. And if we are able to even start from somewhere, I mean, it can encourage more farmers to get on board. But if people are going as low as $3, $2.5 per kilo, um, it will not encourage others to come on. And even how best can you use these small money to maintain your farm and pay your workers? Obviously, you will not, you will not be able to survive. So this is where um, I, I was looking at that maybe there should be a way that if we could have a conversation with all the farmers on board or something, but there should be a way that we should all be able to agree, especially with the, with the raw products, like the, the seeds and maybe the raw, like the powder at least. There should be, I visited, um, I visited Burkina Faso and I noticed that they have a minimum amount of selling their Moringa powder. No matter who you ask, they will not go below a, below, below a particular amount. Majority of the farmers be so small, be it a medium scale, be it a large farmer, they had a minimum amount they were selling their Moringa powder and Moringa seeds. And I noticed that with the French countries as well. In Cameroon, too, the same. In Cameroon, the same. In Benin, the same. In Togo, the same. In Burkina, the same. But in the, in, in the Anglophone countries, it sounds to be different. But I Joshua, I think that that is because we allowed it. We allowed to, you know, to let people walk over the farmers and is it because of agents 
or is it the outside people that come in and pharmaceutical companies that are buying in and are pushing? Look what's happening to the guy from Malawi. He is selling so under below, um, you know, uh, pr producing prices that how can he do it? And he brings it across the border. And um, it, it, it's, they are creating the wrong impression, but how do you stop them? I opened my mouth and I said uh, to a lot of people in South Africa, I said, we have to stand up to it and we have to stop it. We have to bring those minimum pricings in. And then they said, no, they don't want to, they don't want it. But how, how come people cannot understand that they might have a market it's the people who's got market but it's for the people that does not have a market that's got to build the market the way the prices are uh you know the scary part so how can they grow they're not going to be able to grow if people come in and sell below um you know growing prices so yeah that is something that does not make sense to me those who suffer most yes those who suffer most are the are the farmers those who suffer most are the farmers like what eva was saying even though eva hasn't finished uh, eva hasn't finished uh, her farms but she has a target group and she knows what she's about she knows where she's sending her products to so she wouldn't feel the heat but the, there are other farmers that would jump on the idea and say oh well i want to i want to do moringa but the person hasn't got the market where is the person sending it to so the person finishes up and gets stuck and when you get stuck, everybody will just throw up a price. But my thinking was that the platforms that we, we are managing, if we all agree and we set minimum prices, we can, we, 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 we can, we, we, um, we can monitor, we can, we can monitor pricing coming through. And then if somebody is going below a particular threshold, we, we do not approve it. So that at least we can be able to know that maybe Moringa seeds PKM2, especially the PKM2, the local one we have around, minimum, maybe $5, minimum. But it should range maybe from $5 to 10 because in the French countries, they, they, have a, they have a very good price for the seeds and the powder. French countries, if you enter their farms, you notice that they have invested very well in the farms and their prices are high way above with those in the Anglophone area. I have noticed that it, the way we sell our seeds is not like that in the French countries. And whether you go to a big farmer or a small farmer, they have a very good price they give out. But when you come to this side, like in Tanzania and, and Kenya, Kenya has got a very good pricing system. Kenya is good. But in Tanzania, in Uganda, in Malawi, uh, Zimbabwe, the pricing is a little bit on the low side. And, 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 and majority of the experience is from Malawi. Is from um, Uganda. This is so far. These two countries have huge supplies of moringa seeds, but they have the lowest pricing in, in, within within the African continent. Those that are selling very well are the French countries. Their pricing are very good, and you can see that when you get to a farmer, you notice that the farmer is really doing commercial. I mean, he's really into commercial moringa farming. So I, if you narrow it down, I see that the pricing issue we have in, are within in the Southern African countries is Malawi, Zimbabwe, and then in East Africa, it's Uganda. Kenya pricing is very good. They have a very high price. Ghana, some, some people will not even tell you their price. There are people that are selling, but they will not let their price know to you. <laughs> Sorry. I know, but how do we get those prices that they lift their prices? Because there are too many people that are buying from them and they're taking all that at you no know, cost. And it is pharmaceutical companies that are buying it. It's people that are, you know, going into production with um, them at a product that are buying it at a no, no price. How do we yes, uh, yes. How, how, how we could get to them is maybe inviting them on a conversation and letting them understand the need for them to put up their price at a very good rate. But maybe they can also tell you that if they raise their price up, they might lose their buyers. And they don't also want to lose their buyers. 
Yeah, but now remember, some of these people that are bringing it are not the growers. They might be growing a little bit for themselves, but they actually yes. take from uh, from a very poor farmers, and that's yeah. where the, um, okay, so you don't need quality. But uh, when it comes to powder, you do need a clean product. Yeah. But I've also seen the seed. Um, very good quality. The, the people try to those seeds and there's not much money coming out of them. Maybe we could also encourage we could also encourage people displaying their prizes. Yes, we can do that. We can do that. We can, yeah, we can encourage people displaying their prizes because if people start to display prizes, uh, people will know that, oh, so this man is selling his, his Moringa powder for, let's say, no, Moringa seed. I use Moringa seed a lot because it does not require much certification as compared to with powder. So if we start displaying prizes, it can also minimize people under, under, under selling their products. So maybe let us look at how we could encourage a pricing. If you want to display your product, you should quote prices. There are people who will not quote prices. If you ask, I'm selling powder, contact me or inbox me and I'll give you the price. But that's a Ghanaian and, thing. They all, everyone say that here. Yes. You have to disco, you have to inbox for half an hour to get a price with everything. <laughs> But that's Moringa, I think that's we should everything. Do that, Joshua, because it's very, very important. Uh, look, there's uh, all these big companies they have. Hello, can I hear me? Uh, Hello? Hello. Mariana, are you there? Mariana. Mariana, or maybe. I think we lost Mariana. She will jump on. We were discussing, uh, Eva, you were saying something about pricing, people not displaying their prices. But that's the same everywhere here. Yeah. We have, we have to talk with them for half an hour on WhatsApp to yeah. get basic information. That is very true. That is very true. That is very true. If we, we, we can also, we, we can also blow that trumpet out. And as I was saying, uh, before we, dis we, we approve your post on sales, you should quote a price. They should have yeah. a price tag to your product. If we encourage that, those people hiding pricing behind, they could stop. So the, I think out of this meeting, I, I, I will take that on and then- That's, that's a good a, idea. Yeah, that's a, yeah. I will take that on and make a post on that, that before we approve, because African Moringa Hub and, and, and its uh, platforms, we have a total of about 34,000 uh, following. And we have people all the time put, putting up their posts. We do the approval. So we will make a post that henceforth, if you, are, if you want to sell any of our platforms, you should quote a price. Anything you are doing, you should quote a price. If we find out that you don't have a price tagged to your product, we will not approve it. So that people will not be hiding prices and then taking advantage of others and all that. I noticed that there is a program. Some people are advertising a workshop no, uh, an event, this is a conference or workshop, a conference or a workshop. And I contacted the organizers to let me know the cost for those who would like to participate. All they told me was that I should send a mail for, for getting the price. And I said, wow, how do you advertise on our platforms? And we want to know how much it will cost for somebody to attend this conference. Then you tell me to send you an email to get a price, meaning the, 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 the price is not public. That's not right. So some of these must stop. We must be sure that whatever we are bringing out, there's a price tag to it. And then we can be able to know whether you are taking too much advantage over the people or it's a fair trade. 
So I think uh, we can take that on from, from, from the discussions. Hello, Mariana, are you there? I think we lost Mariana. All right, so we lost Mariana now. Hester, you have not said anything. Hester, what do you have to tell us? Um, Hester, I, are you, yeah, Hester, we, we're hearing you. Okay. I'm sorry, um, my signal is very poor uh, because of we've got load shedding. Yeah, I was told, um, yeah. I was, it's very difficult to do price fixing because um, here in South Africa, libel is very expensive. And some of farmers um, do a lot to, to do the, um, growing of Moringa. So um, it's it's really a problem. And um, I can't speak for the farmers because um, I was a farmer about seven years ago, but for the past five years, um, I'm only a distributor. And uh, my concern is about those Moringa that came in for a very, very low price into South Africa. And if you ask for a certification, they said, no, they don't have certification. And, and my motto is always to ask for certification. Do you have a COA? So this is all I can say on this moment. Um, I'm also a member of the Moringa Development of South Africa. And we are going to have very soon a big discussion on this. Um, I will let you know when and what is happening on that. All right. Thank you, Hester. Thank you so much. I think uh, we have exhausted enough and we have shared our ideas with regarding to pr uh, price. And, but what we can take from here is that we will uh, take it up. That anybody trying to make a post or anybody wanting to sell on any of our platforms will have to tag a price to it. There should be a price tag to it. We wouldn't just allow it to be posted anyhow without we knowing a price. And uh, we can move from there. Gradually, as prices are being displayed on our platforms, people will start changing and tuning in their mind to sell our products at reasonable prices. Thank you very much, everyone, for making time for this discussion. It's a recorded version, and uh, it will be displayed on all our platforms. Jeanette will do the editing and then post it maybe tomorrow or the next day. Um, let me just thank those that are still present. Uh, thanks going to Hester. Thanks going to my brother, uh, Ramalaku. Ramalaku. So I, have, I have always had challenges pronouncing your name. Yeah, yeah, I will you call can, you and you get can, it out. You can say yeah. only Laku. Laku is so Laku, short. good. I always yeah. have challenge pronouncing it. It's the first time also meeting such a name. And uh, so no do problem. you have any closing remark? Yeah, thank you. Do you have any closing remark on this? And um, because the pricing issue, we must move forward with it. Do you have any closing remarks with this? And uh, we turn the curtains down. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think it was a very nice uh, event. So in general, uh, the takeaway for me, I think we do have a same challenge. Uh, mm. Yeah, what on the pricing. Uh, two, I think we need to connect with uh, uh, yeah, people with good hearts to get the, the right information in the, the market. Like you said, some people, they don't share, but there are some people who shares. So maybe we, you know, the people like us, we need to team up, connect with the right experts who are open to share such information, you know, keep it a bit transparent and then enable, like you said, farmers to get the right pricing. Yeah, I think we need to find a way to uh, make that happen. Yeah, looking forward. All right. We, we, with African Moringa Hub, we have the people, we know them, the professors, the doctors, the researchers, scientists. We have all those contacts. I can say on authority that we have a very good database with, with, with contacts. What has made us a little bit reserved in that is that um, others will share the, will share. Then those that don't want to share their pro, uh, those that don't want the information to be shared, 
they, uh, uh, they send you messages and all that, you see. Example with this pricing issue, I, I, I brought it up that any product, uh, just about some five, four months ago, I said any post that we, Africa, Moringa City will do, we will add a price to it, a price tag to it. I had received messages from people not to do that, and I stopped. I wanted to take it over on promoting organic Moringa. I had people who said, well, if you start promoting organic Moringa, it will mean that people wouldn't buy the non-organic. So it's like politics in the politics in the industry. When you want to do it in this way, there are some people that feel like it will not go to their favor because at this current stage, the West wants Moringa organic certified. We those in our in our homes here in Africa, we we all we know is the non-organic. We plant and we harvest and we we are go, we are good to go. So if you want to promote it, if you want to promote Moringa on the organic level, that means you are creating the awareness that people shouldn't buy non-organic products. And how many farmers can go organic? So coming back to your uh, coming back to the point you raised, we have the contacts. We, we, they, are, they are they are willing to talk to us anytime. The only challenge is that they don't want to come public. They are willing to talk to us anytime. They wouldn't yeah, like to share their... Yeah. Yeah, but I can say from um, 40 years of personal experience, experience about sharing that in my professional life as a nutritionist, I have always shared everything for free. My teachings, my work, my PowerPoints, my articles, everything. Yeah. And I do believe I honestly do believe there is a spiritual justification because I always manage. I'm not rich, but I always manage. Um, I don't waste my money. I don't exploit people. I have always given trainings for free, consultations for free if people was really in need. And my life has been very rewarding. So I do believe exactly as Ramlaku says that we have to follow <coughs> our hearts. And those that are greedy, and there are many of them, Joshua, the greedy yeah. ones that wants to become yeah. prosperous. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> oh, there are many, many, many here. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> they have a development process within themselves. Yeah. yeah. And we shouldn't we shouldn't carry them on our shoulders. <laughs> yeah. On our shoulders. We have to do what's right for the farmers, <coughs> for the moringa, for everyone. And forget about yeah. the other ones. All right. I would like to finish off with what is called um, a new development. Uh, maybe I'm I find some links on it. <coughs> when you when you do something new in a society, there will be the ones about 4% called the innovators. Then you have about 13% that are the early adapters. <coughs> and those two are the dynamic groups that want to do things. Then the next group is about 25 to 30% uh, that they join in because they think it's prosperous, there's money, but they're not really focused on it. And then you have a slow group never going there. And <coughs> So what we go, yes, we are, you are going to lose people when you do like this. You are going to use, lose people, but you reach the ones that really want to go forward. And that is the important group at the current stage. Okay, over and out. Yeah. And thank you for today. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you so much for always making yourself available to us. Thank you very, very much. I highly appreciate it. I will make time and come and visit you. Uh, I know within a year I will come around because you're not on the you're not in Accra or in Kumase. It's I mean you're off the highway, but I will make time and come and pay you a visit. All right. So thank you everyone, and and we will uh, hook up again. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mr. Heroy. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, and all. Thank you so much. Um, there will be another opportunity again, maybe in a month time, and we'll come around again and share our ideas like this. Thank you very much, and then have the blessed of the weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye.